So I'm going, to, I'm going to go through the introduction super quick and just drop into a demo, because then I can show you this uh, a lot quicker. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Simon Brown. The concept of this talk is Diagrams as Code 2. So in order to move fast as a team in the same general direction, you need good communication. That's really all this is about. And teams need a ubiquitous language to communicate effectively. This is both inside your team units and also outside of your team units. And this is especially relevant if you're doing DevOps and DevSecOps and you're talking to infrastructure staff and security staff and so on and so forth. There is a thing uh, called UML. Uh, UML is one of the kind of standardized ways that teams used to create software architecture diagrams, but not many people are using UML these days for a whole bunch of different reasons. And I've literally heard all the possible excuses you could possibly think of that teams don't use uh, UML these days. And what you'll hear people say is really, you know, just use a whiteboard, the values in the conversation. And although this is good advice on the face of it, it doesn't really provide much guidance for teams and how they should draw software architecture diagrams. And if you go to Google and you do a search for software architecture diagrams, you get a complete mess like this. And this isn't necessarily a tooling issue, it's something much more fundamental. So this is really my starting point for all of this talk. Uh, if you are going to use structured, sorry, if you are going to use boxes and lines type notations, uh, try to do so in a structured way, ideally with a self-describing notation. And this is the heart of my C4 model. So C4 model is um, it's a, a set of abstractions and a set of diagram types that allow you to draw software architecture diagrams at different levels of abstraction. And you can find more information on c4model.com. This is C4. It stands for Context, Containers, Components, and Code. So it's four levels of diagrams that map onto uh, four levels of abstractions that are defined as a part of the C4 model. And really, the concept here is diagrams as maps. So I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. And if you do a search for uh, Jersey on Google Maps, you'll get that picture by default. This is great if you want to know what's inside Jersey and where the airport is. But if you've never heard of Jersey, it's completely pointless. It's too much information too quickly. So how do we fix this? We zoom out to get some context. On the flip side, we can zoom in to get more detail. That's, that's the concept that we're looking at here. So the two diagrams I'm going to introduce very briefly before dropping into a quick demo is, um, is what's called a system context diagram. So this is the top level of the C4 model. The system context diagram basically answers these questions. So what's the system we are describing? Who's using the system we are describing? Uh, roles, actors, personas. What sort of things are they doing with our system? And what system integration points do we need to uh, provide? So answer these questions, and you can craft up a system context diagram like this. So this is uh, from one of my software architecture workshops. In this particular example, the group here was designing this financial risk system. They identified two different types of users with differing uh, responsibilities and use cases. And they identified all of these different uh, system integration points. So this is a nice high-level diagram that shows you the system you're building and how it fits into the world around it. Now what we do is we take that red box in the middle, and we pinch the zoom in, and we can drop down to level two of the C4 model. And this is what's called a container diagram. Not Docker. Forget Docker. I came up with the name first. Totally irrelevant, of course. By container, I basically mean application or data store. So in order to draw a container diagram, we're asking this set of questions. What are the major technology building blocks? What are their responsibilities? And how do they communicate? Answer these questions, and you can craft up something like this. So now we've zoomed into the boundary of that red box in the previous picture. So we still have our users and our system integration points. The red box is the red box in the previous picture. And now we're showing things inside that red box. In other words, applications and data stores that make up this system. So we've got a bunch of front-end uh, React and Java Spring apps. We have some uh, Java command line apps here. And we have a bunch of data stores. And that's essentially the C4 model at the top two levels in a nutshell. The C4 model itself is notation independent. So you can use whatever notation you want to, provided it's self-describing. And you could also use UML, but not many people do that. And my concept behind this is a common set of abstractions is much more useful than a common notation. So that's something to bear in mind as we go through the little demo. So tooling. 
most people are still using uh, general purpose diagramming tools. Visio, Lucidchart, Draw.io, got Diagrams.net, Gliffy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is very prevalent. I don't recommend these tools for drawing architecture diagrams. Why? Because they don't give you any guidance. They don't give you any rules. So when you're drawing a system context diagram from the C4 model, that diagram is only supposed to have two things, people and software systems. If you're using Visio, you can add a box of type component, and Visio is not going to tell you off. So there's no guidance here. You often find that content representation is very mixed in these tools. So if you export a Visio file to XML or a draw.io file to XML, you get this big mess of stuff. And you can't separate content from presentation. That doesn't allow you to render your diagrams in multiple different tools. There's no model. So if you want to draw a system context diagram and a container diagram, as you saw with my quick example, you end up repeating elements across the multiple diagrams. So for example, you have the same users on both diagrams. It's very easy to draw two diagrams, call one user here a business user, and then on the container diagram, that name switches to report viewer. The, the tooling's not going to tell you you've done that wrong. And it's hard to diff. You know, if you've got all of this mess, you just can't stick this into a Git and diff it very easily. So you can't look at individual small changes on your diagrams. And you also can't automate this stuff. You can't like tell Visio to go and generate your diagram from your uh, AWS Cloud Platform, for example. And yeah, when I drew these example diagrams, you might notice that that line's not straight. It's like one pixel out, and it's really annoying, and it takes you ages to kind of fix it. And it's just a waste of time. So uh, back in October 2020, diagrams as code as a concept popped up on the ThoughtWorks tech radar. Uh, it talked about a bunch of different tooling. Diagrams as code is nice. So what you're doing here is you're crafting up a bit of text to create your diagrams. Typically, the, these are automatic uh, layouting tools. They're easy to author. We can use our IDEs, our text-based tools. They're easy to diff because they're just text. They're easy to version control because they're just text. And many of these tools allow you to automate generation of these diagrams. So you can plug them into your CI, CD, and build pipelines, for example. PlantUML is one of the more popular diagrams as code tools. And uh, somebody released some extensions a number of years ago called C4 PlantUML. Essentially, this is a set of macros that help you create C4 diagrams um, on top of the PlantUML tooling. So in this example here, We've got a couple of includes. So these big, long includes essentially include the, the plant UML macros into your plant UML file. We're creating a person and a system and a relationship between the person and the system. And this little bit of text will generate you that diagram. So there's some support for coloring and diagram keys and that sort of thing. The problem with plant UML is that it's a diagramming tool. So if you want to create two diagrams, you have to create two separate text files. Now you can have snippets and include those snippets in, across multiple files, but it tends to get quite complicated quite quickly. But fundamentally, the responsibility is on you to keep your multiple text files up to date. Now, of course, we can use developer tooling and global search to replace to do this, um, but that's uh, one of the downsides of this tooling. So that's what I'm calling diagrams as code one. I want to switch the narrative. I want to go from diagramming to modeling. So modeling is where we're crafting up a centralized model of the things we want to show in our diagrams, and we're drawing multiple diagrams off that single definition of all of the elements and relationships. So when the pandemic hit, uh, most of my income comes from workshops and things like this, and that was all killed off overnight. So I had nothing to do apart from go surfing and make coffee and go cycling, and I thought I should probably do something a bit more productive, and I wrote a bunch of tooling. And a lot of this tooling is under the Structurizer umbrella. I do have some paid tooling, but I'm not going to talk about any of that today. Everything I'm going to talk about today is in this kind of free and open source bubble. So this is all available to use right now completely for free. And the heart of this is something called the Structurizer DSL. And this is a text-based domain-specific language that you can use to craft up a model um, according to the C4 model of your, of your software systems, your architecture, and then create a bunch of diagrams based upon all of that stuff. So on GitHub, so you can go and extend this. It's basically a wrapper around a bunch of existing Java libraries that I wrote a number of years ago. And this is why I'm changing the narrative. Rather than creating multiple text files 
one per diagram, I want to create a single text file that generates you multiple diagrams. And all of those multiple diagrams are essentially kept in sync with one another because they're being generated off a single source of truth. The title of this talk really should have been co called Models as Code, but no one would have turned up because modeling has this horrible association with like big design fronts and stuff like that. And I'm here to show you that's not necessarily the case. So the big difference here is, is we're talking about domain concepts. In uh, languages like Mermaid and Plant Your Mail, you're talking about boxes and rectangles and arrows. Right? That's not good for software architecture diagramming. Plant UML, uh, C4 Plant UML takes this one step further and allows you to talk about people and software systems. So these are domain concepts, um, but we're still in diagramming territory here. I want to do this. I want to craft up a single model as a text file and really talk about those domain concepts because then we can do a lot of interesting stuff under the covers. So let's ditch the slides. Um, let's assume I have Docker running. Perfect. So on Docker Hub is an image called Structurizer Lite. Structurizer Lite is a completely free version of my Structurizer tooling. It's essentially a server-side Java-based web application. Um, let me just do that. So I have a script here which will uh, start the Structurizer Lite Docker container. So you pull it down. Don't do that on conference Wi-Fi. All I'm going to do here is I'm going to run Structurizer Lite and basically do a volume mount against a directory. So I'm just going to basically point the Docker image to a local directory. So if I show you my desktop, there's no folder on here called DevOps. So I'm going to create a DevOps folder, and I'm going to show you the complete out-of-the-box experience for this. So we're going to boot up Lite. We're going to pass it a full path. And hopefully, I did reboot my laptop, so who knows whether this will work or not. This is going to start up the Structurizer Lite Docker thing. Now we've got this DevOps folder that's been created for us. And because this didn't exist, uh, Structurizer Lite has basically created us a template DSL file, a Structurizer DSL file that we can now use. So if I open this, we can take a quick peek. So let's ditch that. So this is the Structurizer DSL. Uh, everything we're doing here, we're defining inside what's called a workspace. A workspace is really nothing more than a wrapper for two things, a model and a set of views. The model is basically the definition of all of your elements and relationships. So here we are defining a person with the title user. We're defining a software system with the name of software system, sorry. And we're saying that there's a relationship between the user and the software system with the description of users. That's it. That's our entire model here. We're also going to define a view. This is a system context view from the C4 model. It's targeted and scoped for that software system. We're going to say include star. Include star basically says, in this instance, include the software system and include things connected directly to it and apply automatic layout. So if I now open my browser and go to localhost 8888, that's the um, uh, port mapping I did. Always agree the T's and C's. <laughs> I promise you there's nothing bad here. And you get this little diagram uh, viewer basically pop up in your browser, and that little text file basis, uh, basically creates you this. So we've got one diagram with our user pointing to our software system. Now, I'm going to show you a bunch of little features. So first of all, I'm not a fan of automatic layout. So we can comment this out, go here, refresh this page, and now we have a bunch more tooling options open, and we can start moving things around, breaking lines, changing the routing, et cetera, et cetera, set the page size. That will auto-save automatically. If we refresh this page, the layout is retained. Where is the layout being retained? If I go back to this DevOps folder, there's a JSON file now. This JSON file is essentially a JSON version of that DSL, which includes all of the x and y coordinates. So what most people do is they just check this whole folder into source code control, and then they have all of the diagram source and all the layout if you want to use um, manual layout, for example. So I'm going to take this back, and I'm going to go back to my diagram and refresh. So imagine this is our system context diagram. Imagine we now want to say, OK, let's look inside that software system box, and we'll see what the containers are that live inside it. So rather than creating an, another text file, what we can do is we can open up set curly braces, and we can say, right, I'm going to have a web app, and that's a container, and it's going to be called web app because I'm not very original. We're going to have a database, which is another container. We're just going to call that database. And we're going to say that the web app 
has a link to the database. We save that. What do you think is going to happen when I do refresh? Nothing. So we've added things to our model, but we've not created a view showing those things. So how do we create a container diagram based upon that new information? We copy this. We change this to container. So we're, now we're creating a container diagram for the software system. It's going to change that. We're going to do include start. Include start, in this case, says includes the containers inside this software system, which are these two things here, and include all of the people and software systems that link to them. So we save that, go back here, refresh. So now we've got our system context diagram, and we now also have a container diagram. But it's not including the person, so we need to fix that. So how do we include the person? Well, we can include the person by doing this, but it's not connected. So we need to add a connection between the person and, say, the web application. So I'm going to remove that, and I'm going to, I'm going to copy this line, basically, and say that the user uses the web app. Go back here, refresh, and now we've got our diagram back again. Let me just change this to automatic layout left to right. There we go. Make it easy to see. So this is nice because now we've got two diagrams generated from that single source. But there's some duplication here, isn't there? You can see that we've got essentially the same relationship to find at two levels of abstraction. We've got a link between the user and the software system and a link between the user and the web application. And that's duplication, and it's not nice. So how do we fix that? Delete this. Go back, refresh. It's still there. So this relationship is the one we've defined, the user to the web app. That's in that source file here. But this relationship. We just deleted. So what's going on here? Basically, because this is model, and the user has a link to the web application, and the web application sits inside the software system boundary, we can create what's called an implicit or implied relationship between the user and the higher level abstraction. So this is a really nice feature that allows us to basically chop down the number of relationships that we have to specifically define. And this is all customizable and configurable. Um, there's a whole bunch of information on the GitHub repo that tells you how to do that. Now, this diagram is kind of ugly, right? It's two gray boxes. So let's go ahead and fix that. How do we fix that? You've got a couple of different options here. Um, there's some support for themes. So if I add the default theme and go back here, we should now see that we've got some styling added automatically. And you can craft up your own themes, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to add a styles section, and I'm going to create a style for the person tag. So all of the elements and relationships have a bunch of text-based tags that get associated with the elements and relationships automatically. It's much like a HTML element, like a DOM element, and you can attach a bunch of CSS classes to it. It's the same kind of concept. So by default, the person element has a person tag. So now what we can do is we can create a style for that person tag. And we can say, let's change the shape to a person. Go back here, refresh. So now we're back to gray, because we took the theme away. But our person is now a person shape. How do we change the color? It's exactly the same as CSS. It's not exactly CSS, but it's the same type of thing. And let's say uh, we'll go white for the foreground text. There we go. And so you just kind of do this over and over again, rinse and repeat. This database, how do we make that a database cylinder? Well, what we can do here is we can start adding things like our own custom tags. So we can open up a set of braces, tags, database. We can go back down here. Whoops. Now we can create an element star for that specific tag we just created. And we can say shape cylinder. One of the things I said right at the start was um, when you're drawing diagrams, you should use a self-describing notation. So how, how do we know that this red thing is a person and this cylinder is a database? Well, this tooling generates your diagram key automatically. So that's something that this tooling does completely automatically based on the styles that you create. So you can craft up a whole bunch of different styles uh, and have a diagram key created automatically for you. Uh, this diagram render also does things like uh, double-click to zoom. And it supports tool tips and, and all sorts of other cool things. So that's a, a kind of quick example of the, the Structurizer 
uh, DSL coupled with Structurizer Lite. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of other things very, very briefly. So what I'm going to do, because we started late, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to take this. I'm going to go to my Structurizer.com website. So there's, um, if you go to Structurizer.com, it's my cloud service. If you go slash DSL, you get this little DSL demo page. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the DSL we just wrote into the demo page, click Render. And we get the same diagrams, and we can zoom in, et cetera, et cetera. The nice thing about the Structurizer DSL tooling is that it's rendering tool independent. So if you don't want to use my Structurizer Lite tooling, you can, auto, you can have uh, an export to things like PlantUML instead. So there's a bunch of open source exporter tools that I built, uh, also on GitHub. And they allow you to basically export the views that you define into different formats. So that's the container diagram in PlantUML format. You can use the C4 plant GML format. So if you like that one more, you can use that. There's an export to Mermaid. So GitHub just started rendering Mermaid kind of natively in uh, Markdown files. So if you could create a bunch of tooling that basically builds yourself a pipeline, turns your Structurizer DSL into Mermaid, dumps that into your uh, GitHub Markdown, and then you can have these diagrams rendered automatically. And there's a couple of other export formats as well. So that's one of the, the nice features here. Um, it's kind of rendering tool independent. What else was I going to show you? How does this work with bigger, more complicated software systems? That's always one of the questions I always get. So let, let's address that one. I'm going to shut down this example we've just done. And I'm going to fire it up against another example, which is in my services folder. The services example. is this one. So the Structurizer DSL also allows you to do things like include. So here we're including a model DSL, and that model DSL is basically uh, it's a definition of a bunch of services. Imagine you've got a microservice-based architecture. It's, it's a definition of a bunch of services. So that's not important here. If I go back to my web browser and we reboot that light page back up, because that one. So now we start to Structurizer Lite against a different folder with a different workspace. And here is the example we're going to be showing very, very briefly. So imagine we've got some sort of software system that we consider to be made up of a bunch of services. We've got a user using a web application, and then the web application kind of using this horrible distributed big ball of mud I've created here. So you know, please don't do this sort of thing. But imagine this was not like eight services. Imagine it was like 20 services. This diagram is going to start to get cluttered really, really quickly. So how do we solve this problem? Option number one, don't draw diagrams. So although all of the stuff I've shown you so far is like traditional boxes and arrows type diagrams, uh, built into the Structurizer Lite rendering engine is a D3 force directed graph. And it turns out uh, this kind of interactive D3 force directed graph is a really nice way to uh, describe and visualize much, much bigger data sets. So this is the same uh, thing that we showed in the diagram, and it supports tooltips. So you can click on things and find connected neighbors, and there's um, quick search and all that sort of stuff. So this is a really nice way to explore a kind of much um, bigger set of information. So that's kind of option one for dealing with uh, bigger data sets. Option two is, and again, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat here a little bit. So I'm going to go to structurize.com slash JSON. So in that services folder, there's a JSON document. So that's the thing that um, was created when we rendered the diagram initially. I'm going to go render. We will get the same diagram I showed you before. Again, you can also export that to plant UML, et cetera, et cetera. I've shown you this already. There's this thing over here called Ilograph. It's another export format that's created by the open source tooling. I'm going to take this. I'm going to go to Ilograph.com or app.ilograph.com. So this, this tooling is nothing to do with me. This is a, um, a piece of tooling that's a really nice way to navigate a hierarchical data set. I'm going to remove all that, paste in my version, click down here, and this is Ilograph. So this is now showing you the same information I showed you before, but it's interactive. So now we can start clicking around, and we can start zooming in and out of the of the uh, software architecture model that we've created here. So this is option two uh, for dealing with bigger data sets. Again, don't draw a traditional boxes and arrows diagram. Use something like Ilograph as a way to explore this data. 
Option three, because we were like having lots of options, imagine we've got this diagram and it's showing us 20 services. Why have one diagram showing 20 services? Why don't we have 20 diagrams showing a single service? So that's the other option here. So what you do instead is you create kind of individual diagrams that in this case focus on a single service. So this diagram here focuses on service one, and it's essentially showing you things going into service one and things coming out of service one. How do we do the same thing with service two? It's exactly the same deal. We craft up a diagram and we say, right, put service two on the diagram and include things coming into service two and things coming out of service two. With tools like Visio, Lucidchart, Draw.io, you've got to copy paste all these elements and it's a complete nightmare. With the DSL tooling, what you can essentially do is this. So we can say, craft me up a container diagram for my software system, include the user, include service one, and include things going into service one and coming out of service one. And the same for service two. So if I craft up another one here for service three, change two to three, two to three, save it, refresh. We've now got this diagram here, which is focused on service three, things coming out of it and things coming into it. So this is a really nice way, again, to partition your diagram and to create multiple smaller sizes that all tell a part of the, the bigger story. So that's the, the demo. There's, there's lots of other stuff I could show you, but of course, we uh, started a bit late, and I do want to finish on time so we don't upset the next speaker. Uh, all the slides will be in line, and all the stuff I've kind of shown you is all in the slides. There's all support for themes. Uh, where's my theme slide gone? It's gone, it's disappeared. So uh, lots of people are fans of uh, AWS architecture diagrams. So this is an example deployment diagram created with my tooling and then spiced up using AWS architecture icons. So I've previewed up some themes for AWS, for Azure, for GCP, so you can apply those things to your diagrams. And again, model-based diagrams using the AWS icon sets and, and you get the diagram key generated automatically for you. So let's uh, skip to uh, a few last slides. There's support for scripting, so I added support for JSR223, the JavaScripting API, so you can write your DSL and you can include scripts in Kotlin, Groovy, JRuby, or, or JavaScript if you're using the Rhino engine, into your DSL. Why might you want to do that? Maybe you want to do something like this, uh, create the default set of views, but turn off automatic layout. So because the DSL is essentially a wrapper for the underlying Java library, uh, the scripting support gives you access to that underlying library and you can do whatever you want to. Uh, this supports inline scripts, and you can also call out to external files. Uh, there's also an, an interface you can uh, implement, and you can uh, build your own plugins if you want to do kind of more type safe or bigger uh, things. And you can also use both of these together. So you might want to craft up like a high level view of your architecture, maybe showing systems and containers. So here we've got an example, and we've defined this web application here. And then we want to use some Java code to say, right, we want to load the workspace created by that DSL. So the DSL parser is all open source. It's all on Maven Central. You can just hook it up to your, your uh, program as a dependency. So we're going to parse the workspace we created before. We're going to find the thing called a web application. And then we're going to write a bunch of code to use static analysis or reflection or parse a, a Terraform file or a CloudFormation file or script or something to go find things that exist in the real world and pull them and insert them into our architecture model. So this is a way to kind of craft up the high level thing, maybe explicitly, and then use programmatic techniques to go find the rest of our architecture model. So you've got a whole bunch of ways you can use this tooling, which is cool. Most people, uh, when they use this tooling, they're handcrafting their DSL files. There's a way to do workspace extensions, and there's a way to do include, so you can modularize your workspace files. But yeah, most people end up handcrafting these things. Diagrams as data, I think, is really interesting. So diagrams as data is where you are parsing your AWS cloud environment, and you're finding things that you want to show in your diagrams, and you're including those things in your model. So there's some interesting stuff you could do. It's obviously not f f free in terms of effort. You need to write some code to do this. But there's some cool stuff you can do here nonetheless. And this goes a little way towards keeping your diagrams actually in sync with the real world, whether the real world is code or your deployment um, environments, for example. Most people want to uh, export static diagrams, PNG, SVG files, 
My Structurizer tooling allows you to do this. Uh, the Plant UML tooling allows you to do this. So most of the tool chains allow you to get PNG or SVG files. I'd rather have interactive diagrams, though. I'd rather people check to that folder with the workspace DSL file into source code control, and then along with the script that allows people to boot this thing, thing up and look at the diagrams interactively. And the interactive diagrams allow you to do filtering and, and, and um, a whole bunch of other stuff I didn't get time to show you. So some closing thoughts. I think diagrams as code is cool. It's a great developer-friendly technique. Uh, it's all text. We can version control text. We can diff text. We can integrate it into our build pipeline. So that's super awesome. I want to take this to the next level and move away from diagramming towards something which is more akin to modeling. So we're crafting up a single definition of the world and exposing multiple views on that thing. This also allows you to separate content from presentation, which is what allows you to render your diagrams using different diagramming tools, which I think is a, is a really powerful part of this tooling. I want to get to the point where we're not stuck with our diagrams. One of the things I see with diagrams is because people spend two and a half hours trying to line boxes up in Visio, if somebody says, no, that's wrong, you need to change it, like, no, I just spent two and a half hours making this diagram look pretty, please don't make me change it. Right, we should get over that mindset, and we should have the diagrams generated auto automatically. And again, hopefully, I've shown you some ways to approach that. The caveat with this tooling, it's much more developer friendly. So if you have non-developers who might want to craft up some of these diagrams, the diagrams as code thing might put people off. So that's something to bear in mind, of course. How do I recommend you use these things? Store all of this stuff in source code control next to your source code. When you're doing pull requests for features, include the diagrams and the documentation as part of this pull request. And then all of your documentations and diagrams um, are part of the same change package, essentially. And if you need people to have access to this, you can publish these diagrams uh, to other places. So there are a bunch of things you can find online on GitHub that allow you to, to take a structurized DSL definition and create a HTML microsite with uh, PNG embedded images, for example. Um, you can store structural, structurize a light on a build server, so you can give it a permanent URL that people can go and visit if they want to. I tend to use this tooling for longer lived documentation when I'm doing upfront design. It's whiteboards and pieces of paper. So for me, this tooling really sings when you're doing longer lived documentation that you want to keep around. If you thought this was interesting, uh, there's a DSL cookbook you can find on the DSL repo that gives you a bunch of like, how do I do this specific thing? And there's interactive examples. You can click on the images and get sample DSL files. And if you want to try this out without installing anything, go to that URL, structurizer.com slash DSL. And that will give you the little demo page that I showed you. So thank you very much. Apologies about technical issues. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to come and grab me afterwards. Thanks a lot.